Well, Jackie, I'm here surrounded by thousands of people on the Mall in Washington, D.C., where 57 years ago today, on the steps of the Lincoln Memorial, you can see there behind me, Martin Luther King gave his I Have a Dream speech that was to become the defining moment in American civil rights history. And in that context, given the protests in Kenosha and Minneapolis, it's almost inconceivable that the president of the United States would not come here to address the people in his own backyard who say, as was summed up by the Reverend Al Sharpton earlier on, that black lives matter and we won't stop until they matter to everybody. Instead, the President Donald Trump is on his way to give one of his big rallies in New Hampshire this evening, where he will no doubt use the same dark and divisive language that characterized his speech to the Republican convention last night. President Trump and the First Lady emerged triumphant, as if in a fairy tale, as if COVID-19 was a thing of the past, the economy was booming and racial tensions were cured. And if anyone thought there'd be even the slightest inkling of unity, from the very start, the tone was set. This election will decide whether we save the American dream or whether we allow a socialist agenda to demolish our cherished destiny. Instead, this was a speech that sought, as the entire week had done, to recast Donald Trump as the savior of the American people, the man who alone could heal the multiple crises rocking the nation. Always remember, they are coming after me because I am fighting for you. But there was one central theme. Joe Biden is weak. Joe Biden is not a savior. He is the destroyer of America's jobs. China would own our country if Joe Biden got elected. In fact, he mentioned Joe Biden more than 40 times, blaming the Democrat for everything from the riots to the economy, as if Biden were the president and he, Trump, was standing on the sidelines observing the chaos. Joe Biden's plan is not a solution to the virus, but rather it's a surrender to the virus. A virus that so far killed 180,000 Americans on his watch. And as he spoke, just look at the maskless masses packed on the south lawn of the White House with no social distancing. And this perhaps premature promise. We are delivering life-saving therapies and will produce a vaccine before the end of the year, or maybe even sooner. The president did mention the protest in cities like Kenosha and Minneapolis, but there was no acknowledgement. It was police shootings that initiated the unrest. Instead, he appeared to use the cries for racial justice to scare rather than heal American voters. If the Democrat Party wants to stand with anarchists, rioters, looters, and flag burners, that is up to them. But I, as your president, will not be a part of it. And with that, he unleashed a Disney fairy tale ending, as if he'd won already. But outside, protesters displayed another message about the president. And today, tens of thousands will make their voice heard too, as they gather for the anniversary of Martin Luther King's I Have a Dream speech. Because they came in 63, we were able to come back in 2020, riding whatever we wanted to ride, stay in whatever hotels was available. They opened the door for us, but there's still some doors we have to open and some people we've got to straighten out. The president won't be joining them, though. He's on the way to a rally in New Hampshire, firing up his base as he seeks another four years. Back now to our main news. Thousands of people have turned out in Washington, D.C., calling for racial justice at the spot where Martin Luther King Jr. delivered his I Have a Dream speech. More than half a century on, Kieran Moodley looks back at some key moments of the U.S. civil rights movement. ...passage of President Kennedy's civil rights bill. Five decades after Dr. King's dream, a 21st century rainbow coalition descended on the US Capitol, the latest march in a centuries-old struggle for racial justice. A rally led by the families of Trayvon Martin, Breonna Taylor, George Floyd. Names that shouldn't be well known, names that should be just ordinary, everyday Americans. 
But this rally is about how for far too many African Americans, there is no ordinary day. We will meet the moment. We will work towards healing, justice, and collective liberation like our lives depend on it, because they do. The death of George Floyd, unarmed, his neck knelt on by a police officer, sparked protests around the world, leading to today. We and today marks 57 years since the March on Washington, when a quarter of a million Americans saw Dr. Martin Luther King preach his dream. A dream that, just like now, called for the nation to unite around the cause of civil rights. With this faith, we will be able to transform the jangling discords of our nation into a beautiful symphony of brotherhood. A close friend and organizer alongside Dr. King was Bernard Lafayette, who spoke to me about the power of that moment. Mass gatherings solidified the spirit of the movement. So that March on Washington showed, and it represented all kinds of people. It showed that, that many white people, you see this movement is not black folks against white folks. This movement is for uh, accomplishing a beloved community, as Martin Luther King talks about. What you saw outside the White House, does that also have a symmetry in terms of on the Edmund Pettus Bridge, you know, when peaceful protest was met with the violence of racism? I frankly was surprised to see the kind of hostility that comes out. But at the same time, I get overjoyed when I see the large number of uh, different uh, ethnic groups coming together. We are in the process of repeating history. Ancestors watching, they're watching. Those repeating history today include activist Jonathan Likes, versed in the tactics of those before him, but his group very much representing the present. The George Floyd moment was so pinnacle because it took place while two other crises were happening. We have the crises of an international pandemic. And we have the crises of economic depression. It re-sparked the crisis of 400 years of racism in this country. But whilst aware of their connection to history, many activists differ in the way they organize. This movement is not one group, but a coalition of decentralized voices. That's both a break from history, as well as a lesson from it. The movement for black lives is intentionally decentralized because the civil rights movement ended once they killed Martin Luther King and Malcolm X. So we wanted to make sure that we created a movement that if one person was killed or taken out or couldn't continue, the movement didn't die with those individuals. Trinise McNally is another activist who sees this movement as not just being transformative in its demands, but to finally bring a voice to those often left out of the struggle. What we're saying is we must center the most marginalized in order to get free in any march, any action, any policy, any, anything that you think you're doing in service of black people. If it is not led by historically marginalized folks, then you're actually not doing the work that you have a responsibility to do. If the people may change, if the groups differ, and if the demands alter, one thing remains constant that for 400 years, African-Americans have faced slavery, Jim Crow, police brutality, and yet through it all, they cling to a belief in a better America, one that will eventually give them the freedom they were promised. We have to constantly make them aware of our history, and then your future becomes a, a possibility. We come from a lineage of the black radical tradition that believes in the liberation of all black people. And even if I do not see it in my lifetime, I truly believe that we will see it in the next. It's a long road to freedom. Many have told us that before. And we will keep marching and keep shouting and keep hosting direct actions and keep disrupting until our voices are heard and until we win liberation for all. <laughs>